So jumping and landing that is accepted in gymnastics is putting that kid at a really high risk of hurting yeah. the knee, you know? Yeah. All right. We're live, man. We are here with someone who I'm very lucky to have as a mentor and someone who has helped me uh, professionally, academically, personally as well. My friend, Lenny Macrina. How are you? I'm good, Dave. How are you? I'm good. This is amazing because usually Lenny just sits next to me in my desk and we make all these jokes and stuff. And now we have to act somewhat professional for a yeah, podcast. Professional. Like usually I stare at you. I yell at you. You can't hear me because you're listening to something really loud. <laughs> so I'm used to looking at you wearing big headphones, but usually you can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time, it's, uh, we have a, a window in front of our desks. And usually what happens is I glance up for a moment and I see Mike and Lenny and people behind me like looking over my shoulder and making fun of me <laughs> and judging me reading like epigenetic studies. And I just, uh, just try my best to focus. And we had been yelling at you for 10 minutes. You hadn't heard a word we said. <laughs> I wonder if I should put a, I should put a secret recorder in like my top drawer of my desk and just go for a study session and just see what really, <laughs> really people think about me. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about something. I mean, you're kind of well known for many things in the PT, uh -huh. but I think you have a lot of work with Kevin and Mike in the shoulder, but also you guys have done a ton of work in the knee itself. And so I figured that I'd want to have you on for an hour to talk about, um, have like a super honest conversation about, you know, some of the stuff going on with the realities of ACL research and, you know, practically what we see in the clinic. That's a super devastating injury for ACLs, but also just big surgeries, like a lot of overuse type stuff. I mean, we both work in a lot of youth knee injuries, right? With, you know, you obviously work with baseball and college athletes as well, but we see a lot of kids, high school to college that are, you know, really having a tough time with like multi-year injuries. So that's really what I wanted to kind of chat about. But the most important question that I think relates the most to knees, uh, bending the knee. How did you feel about the end of Game of Thrones? Um, I was disappointed with season eight in general. I know a lot of people liked season eight uh, or some of season eight. I, I just, I don't know. I had, I had kind of been wa binge watched over the past few months, everything. So I had everything fresh in my head and to see what they did with season eight, it got yeah. me. So I still bend the knee, but on my <laughs> ACL patients, I'm, I'm still <laughs> struggling with uh, how they ended Game of Thrones. So. <laughs> Spoiler alert, if you haven't watched season eight, right, exactly. pause it, skip forward 30 seconds right now because exactly. I'm going to spoil something. I personally feel that episode three should have been the finale. That was the best yeah. episode I've watched in a yeah. long time. I wish, they'd, yeah, yeah. I wish they'd flip flop the storyline there, but yeah, it was right. tough. It was a tough yeah. ending. Anyways, back to segues of bending the knee with ACL patients. Um, exactly. Let's go first. There's, there's two kind of categories of injuries we see. We see the, uh, the traumatic kind of blowout, which is unfortunately just a reality of all sports. You know, I think that's in some degrees you could do everything perfect. And obviously we'll talk about modifiable, modifiable risk factors, but that just happens. You know, you take the risk with any sport, but there's also the other side, which I think it's probably like a 70, 30 split, like the overuse, you know, the Osgood slaughters, the shin splints, the cartilage issues and stuff. Can you right. speak to like the differences between, you know, those two big categories first, just to frame up the conversation then we'll kind of dive into more of the acute stuff. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, you and I both do, you know, I think you and I do both do that kind of that chronic injury kind of world, you know, you got your gymnastics where you get the acute stuff, obviously in both sports, but I think the acute stuff is a completely different world and a completely different mechanism, obviously, but it's a completely different thought process for us in baseball. I do a lot of baseball for those that don't know, and we see a ton of OVU stuff, shoulder, elbow, and we're talking about 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kids that have growth plate injuries and you get them similarly in the, you know, the low back pain that turns into a stress reaction or a stress fracture, you get uh, OCD lesions of the elbow, which we also see in baseball. So I think it's that obviously what we're doing to our kids, I say kids because that's what they are, but they're not adults. They are children who are skeletally immature. Um, we are putting a ton of stress, more stress through their body than their body can handle oftentimes. And something has to give. We think, oh, we can keep going, go, 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 go. At least in baseball, two, three hours of practice, they're basically done. Gymnastics, it's crazy how much how much they do. Where they'll have five, six hours a day of practice at, at, that I know of, and you probably know it. Maybe it's even more than that for some. And obviously, something has to give, and that's why we're seeing this increase. I think it's an increase, at least since I've started working with you a few years ago. It's it just it blows my mind. I just sit back at my desk and I just look at those kids, boys and girls, coming in to see you, and I just shake my head like man, what are we doing? So I applaud you, and I probably have never said this to you, um, I applaud you and what you are trying to do because 
it's a world that nobody has really taken on. Nobody's been verbal about it. And you're doing it in a way that I think is very, it's professional, it's scientific, it's meaningful. There's, there's so much that change that has to occur. And we tried it for baseball and we're, we're succeeding. We worked on pitch counts for baseball. We worked on innings limits. Um, you know, the, a catcher can also pitch. So I think those things have helped, but there's still this, this whole, um, you know, injury risk that we see in kids because coaches don't know this stuff or the rules aren't implemented or, or they aren't followed. And I don't know what, what the story is with gymnastics, but I think there has to be, you know, a shift, no pun intended, uh -huh. in, uh -huh. uh, in, in, in what has to be done, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're saying that I, uh, I definitely agree. It's, it's a challenging field to work in, you know, just, just the amount of work that has to go into trying to change people. That's honestly what it comes down to is changing oh, people's yeah. mind and yeah. stuff. It's hard because as you and I know, we see, loads of research and data come out that's like, man, like, you know, kids are tearing their ACLs at younger ages. They're getting growth plate issues. They're getting, you yeah. know, a lot of kids are tearing their Achilles at a younger age. That's like obviously closely related to knee landing mechanics and gymnastics. But it's something that, you know, I've found that it's not until somebody sees the reality of the problem, I guess, in a more of like a one-on-one -on -one relationship, do they really realize how bad it is. You can look at numbers, you can look at odds ratios and risk ratios, and it looks on paper, graphs and it stuff. That mean anything. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Then you think about the stats and you're like, wow, that's like 75 kids that blew their ACL out, right? Or like, oh my right. God, they're, like, they're 13 years old, 14 years old. And right. I think that when somebody finally sees one of their teammates get hurt, they see one of their kids get hurt, or like a coach sees an athlete they've been working with for 10 years to try to get to a college scholarship. They see them have this massive blowout knee right. injury. You know, they get an OCD lesion or something on their knee. Like that's when it really hits home. So thankfully we're seeing more and more people who are embracing you know, new concepts that we, you know, backwards the other way, I don't think I've ever said it to you guys, but the only reason I can do so much work in gymnastics is because we have champions like a, like Mike calls it it's like a Petri dish for, for learning and for information. And like, we have a bunch of college gymnasts coming to champion now and lifting in the summer that that's, that would have been like, I got laughed at five years ago when I said that. Right. So it's only because we have a framework of all of our sports athletes doing that, that we can do that. But a lot of that goes down to the work. I can learn. No, definitely. It's getting the word out. It's getting a platform that you've, you've connected with docs um, in the area that have, you know, like-minded and, and I think it's just, it's, it's getting to the coaches. That's our, always our challenge in baseball. We can get to the parents. They want to hear us. We can get to the medical professionals. Obviously, we're all on the same page oftentimes trying to educate. But until we can get to the coaches, and then even then getting to the coaches is usually not enough because they are in their ways. They have their training regimens. It's worked all these years, and they don't want to break that that thought process. And that's the difficult aspect is implementing new concepts, new training concepts, new thinking that just completely blows away anything that has ever been done before, because to them, it hasn't, it, it, it's not what they've been doing. You know what I mean? And they have their recipe and you can't mess with their recipe. And until they either leave the profession or they're forced out because parents. So I think the parents have a big say in this and how things could go. It's just, I see it a lot. You see it in gymnastics. I know it. I see it in baseball too. They don't want to mess with little Billy's uh, ability to play. They don't want to speak up to yeah. the coach. So then it turns into the coach is like the hierarchy. And then even the parents who are paying the money for these kids to play and, and perform, they kind of oftentimes sit back. And I think the parents really have, uh, if we can get to the parents as like that, that intermediary with the coach, I think we're onto something, but the coach ultimately has the final say. And I think that's what we're still seeing is that's why we still see it in baseball. We still see it in gymnastics in particular, you know, our two sports that we kind of know. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of really important things to unpack here. So I want to sit on it for a while, but obviously as a coach, I mean, I still coach five days a week. I understand the other side of the coin, the pressure of trying to, you know, kids want to get, you know, in baseball, they want to throw harder. They want to, you know, look to a college scholarship in gymnastics. They want to get new skills. They want to get looked at by schools. Like that's, that's what most kids want is the opportunity to possibly play in college. And so from the coaching side, it's tough because you're trying to push the athlete positively in, in that optimal dose of stress. So they get stronger, they get like faster, whatever it is, but you find this, this, unfortunately what happens is that you, you sometimes have young kids that are really talented and then they get pushed really hard when they're like 11 to 14 and they're, they're doing ball programs for you guys or they're doing like insane training hours for gymnastics. And I think that that's where it starts to become a problem. Can you uh, maybe speak to from more of an injury point of view about like what's the big concern about if we do push too hard and maybe we do have like an ACL injury or something like that or meniscus stuff, like what's the ramifications of that long term from what maybe the research says or right. some, some on surgery and stuff? Yeah, not to get too technical, because I know your, your listeners range from parents to coaches to medical practitioners. So I'll try to keep it kind of simple. But 
when, when somebody tears their ACL, there's a whole mechanism that occurs in the knee joint. You disrupt the, the, the pressure in the knee. Your knee is under pressure. There's a vacuum in the knee. It gives stability to the knee. You create an inflammatory cascade within the knee, so you get an inflammatory process in the knee. Uh, there was a study that came out a few years ago that showed that when you tear your ACL, every single person in this study had a bone bruise that happened in the knee. What's the ramification of a bone bruise? So when you tear your ACL, the bones shift rapidly and you get them to kind of bounce off each other. That bouncing effect causes a bruise somewhere on the knee joint, either on the mm -hmm. femur, the top bone, or the tibia, the bottom bone. So we think that that may lend itself to creating uh, further issues down the road, meaning arthritis. So, yeah. you, you know, and then you put on top of that, that they have a meniscus tear. The meniscus that for those that don't know, um, is the cartilage in the knee joint. So it helps to absorb shock. So when you jump and land, you know, when you're healthy and jumping and landing, that meniscus is kind of pushing the forces. It's kind of dissipating the forces. So they're not so focal on the bone mm -hmm. and that, that meniscus, if it tears, it's going to change the way the forces are transmitted within the knee joint, which means now you're going to get focal pressure within the knee breaking down of the cartilage and then arthritis. That's what arthritis is, right? It's an inflammatory process within the knee joint. This is down the road, but it's not that far down the road. We've seen people that tear their ACL 10 years later. So if you tear your ACL in your teens or 20s, when you're 30, 40 years old, you have a potential arthritic knee. So mm. it's a big problem. And it's a huge burden for not only the person whose function is now limited. These are usually people that have been athletic since they were 10 years old, a gymnast, and now they're 25, 30 years old and they're hobbling around because their knee does not feel good and they have arthritis. And now they're trying to seek other opinions. Then they go to a doctor and have another surgery. And, and, and then that cascade just continues to occur. And then by 30, 40 years old, now they're, they're limping in saying, I think I need my knee replaced. Uh, never mind the fact that if you tear your ACL, you're at a higher risk of re-tearing your ACL, right? It's like in most other injuries. You have a hamstring strain, you have a higher risk of straining your hamstring <laughs> sometime in the near future. It's the same thing with an ACL. A hamstring strain is a lot different than an ACL, right? You, you rehab yeah. it for a few weeks, six weeks, and hopefully you're fine, we think. Yeah. ACL, you're, that's a year of your life, year of your competitive life. Never mind a year of your life and your family's life that's disrupted. So now you have a higher risk of an ACL tear within the first two years after the, after the surgery. You have a higher risk of arthritis in the knee joint, and you have a, probably a higher risk of eventually having something be done in your knee that's, you know, that's permanent, meaning like a knee replacement or something like that. So and between all that is just a change in how your life is. It's just, it's funk, it's, 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 uh, you, you become frustrated, you become depressed, angry. I mean, all these people want to be active and now they can't do it. So it's not just the physical side, it's the mental side too that people become affected. And I see it all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think especially in obviously like in, a, in an older adult, they can kind of cope with some of that like time right. away from more. But like when you have like a 12 to 15 year old kid who like loves baseball, loves volleyball, loves like it's yeah. all they are, it's like who they are as a person besides school and their friends, like that's their community. And like, that's where they get a lot of their development from. So when you take somebody out of that for six to nine months, and then you like, they're super nervous about going back and they're worried about getting hurt again. Like that's pretty devastating for a young kid. Yeah. And it's not just, it, it, it's people, you can do the best rehab and we think we do very good rehab and, and we have people that retail their ACL. It happens. Yeah. It's not just because you had a bad doctor or a bad therapist or you, you bad coach. It happens to the best of us. So even if you put all the work in and you think you've done a year of rehab and you are ready to go, you can retear it. And now it all happens again. And the second time is never as good as the first, as we know. And so, yeah, right why the risks are just crazy to that because of the stress of putting on the joints, the fatigue, the inability to be strong enough to do it. They become, you know, the, the muscle may not be as strong for the stresses you put on, especially at the end of a training session, other than mm -hmm. the, um, a, a, a meso cycle, macro cycle where they've been training for months and now it's that end and the competition's about to happen. And it, it's just, there's so many different factors that play into this. And if we can control those, those little factors daily, I think it adds, and that's kind of with the, the Tim Gabbett world, the acute chronic uh, uh, workload that we're gonna that we're gonna um, probably talk about, or you know, you've talked about in the past, mm -hmm. is those those mini loads, those daily loads that we're seeing on the kids lead lead to this huge uh, chronic workload issue that kids just can't handle, and then uh, you know, then something's gonna give. And I know you you've you've implemented this with gymnastics, which is which is tremendous, and I think baseball is a little different world, so we've we've yeah. struggled with that so far. 
Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, obviously once you have an injury, whether it's a huge blowout like this, or maybe you just have a small thing, you're, it's never the same. Like when you have a, an injury as bad as an ACL say, like it's never as good as what you were given with. Right. You know what I mean? Like the, the stuff doctors can do, PTs can do, good coaches can do. It never will replicate the anatomy you once had. And that's a huge, you know, you disrupt the knee joint a little bit and that really throws off things quite a bit. And I think this, this really works well into the conversation about the, I think what's the bigger issue is the overuse type stuff because overuse right. injuries like the, in our world, it's like the Osgood slaughters of growth plates or right. the, you know, the Sinden Johnson Hansen syndrome, like the bone bruises, the stress fractures. Like if you have a stress fracture in your knee as a, a 13 year old kid, like that is a huge, huge red flag, right? Like that's right. clearly people come all the time to champion. We think we do good work and people try to come see us. They're like, give me the best exercise. I need this. My posture's off. My hips are out of alignment. Right. Like, no, you are doing too much and your body right. can't handle it. That's, yeah. that's the only way you get a stress from. Parents don't want to hear that. It's just like, you know, for me, baseball, it's, you know, little Billy, he's getting pitching lessons. He's pitching in three different teams. He's also taking hitting lessons. He's got school. He's all this stuff. And then, you know, it, it's a volume issue. It's very simple. Is a 13 year old can't handle all of that. They're not an adult. And, and it's tough to have that conversation with a parent because like you said, they want to know, what's the fix? Is it, are they just tight? Are they just weak? Yeah. Give them a couple band exercises to, to have them do. And it's not, it's not just about that. It's a, it's an education on, on what they're doing. It, it, and I think sometimes they, they don't even consider it. And then when we say it I, a lot of the times, not, not often, but sometimes a light bulb will, will go off and they'll leave thinking, okay, we can implement this. I don't know if they do though. I don't know if they want to, because I know little Billy still has, all of his things he has to do, but hopefully a light bulb eventually goes off when the bad injury happens. The elbow pain, the vague elbow pain, they can probably handle it and, and then move on. But when they have that big UCL sprain, like a Tommy John, or they have the big uh, OCD lesion in the elbow, where they have to have surgery and now they shut down for six months or a year. Same, same thing in gymnastics. I think hopefully that's finally, you know, and that's finally the, the discussion that they finally have the realization, but it's too late by then. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they know that it's way too late at that point that their, their career yeah. is, is, is over probably for a gymnast and for a baseball player. You have an elbow surgery at 13. Yeah. Kiss it's, tough. Death, you know? it's tough. So, and I've, uh, yeah. I've unfortunately seen a lot of kids now elbow and knee were talking together, but like a lot of kids back low or low back or elbow or knee. It's like, you know, they come in, they get an OCD injury and the parents are like, dude, we can't do this anymore. And like they, I've had so many kids this year, quit from OCD elbows in the sur in yeah. surgery. Pop. I've had a lot of kids quit from, uh, you know, growth plate issues in the knee or cartilage issues in the knee or big fractures yeah. in the knee. Like, you know, they had, I, I think it's really hard to come back from like a, a, a really aggressive spondy fracture or an elbow issue when you're that young. Right. So, you know, unfortunately what happens is like, it's the same thing with gymnastics, right? So they get the equivalent to baseball pitching lessons. They're getting a, a four hour practice. They're going to weekend meets. They're doing uh, six days a week training. They're 20 hours a week, year round camps in the summer, traveling for this showcases, whatever. And it's like, right. anybody, anybody going to take a couple weeks off to chill? Yeah, like, we, every, two weeks of Christmas. We got, we got to take Christmas off for a couple of weeks. <laughs> we rested. <laughs> <laughs> we're better. We're better. And everyone's, right. it's so funny because everyone in the gymnastics world, and this happens in, in not just gymnastics, but youth sports, they're, they're saying that it's the time away that's causing the injury, but they're like, no, it's the Monday morning back when you bury kids right. because they right. week off and you spike their training volume that they, right. they start to make these shins and stuff. I think one advantage that, again, I hate to compare baseball, that's my world to gymnastics, but I think the concept, one advantage that baseball has is training is very acceptable in baseball. It's okay to train, meaning to get stronger. Um, you know, they used to be like, we don't want to get them too big, they'll get too tight. And I think we've realized that with Eric Cressy and, and us at Champion that um, you can work on strength training and it won't affect the person. It's actually needed so they can support what they're trying to do, which is all the lessons and, and all the games that they're playing. And I think that world still hasn't, we've, we've seen the, we're at the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, with gymnastics and that we actually have a bunch of girls and guys training uh, this summer and not to date the podcast, but it's, it's, you're breaking down some barriers. And I think it's, mm -hmm. there's still a huge, huge, huge world that does not accept training. And fortunately, baseball, we do, and we still have injuries, but yeah. I think that maybe it would have been worse. I don't know. We still see a ton of Tommy John injuries and we still see a ton of shoulder injuries in baseball. It's just a matter of what training. So, so what the problem is in, in baseball is we, we, we allow training, we want training and then kids take it 
way extreme. Well, coaches do as well. They take it way extreme where they start doing not just training. They also have to long toss, meaning long toss going out to 200 plus feet. Then they have to do weighted ball programs where they hold in a, a six ounce. A, a baseball weighs five ounces. They have to hold a six ounce, a 10 ounce, a 32 ounce b- ball and throw it as hard as they can. So we're doing yeah. some research at Champion. Mike and I, Mike Reinald and I, and Glenn Fleissig at uh, American Sports Medicine Institute in Birmingham, and Dr. Andrews, who's like the world-renowned surgeon. And we've put some research out that's showing the stresses on the elbow and the effects of the shoulder and elbow using these weighted balls may be detrimental. So because there's a whole world out there that thinks training is good, let's make training extreme and make it baseball baseball specific. And so hopefully gymnastics has to figure out a way to, you know what I mean? I don't know what the equivalent would be, like putting ankle weights on somebody while they're doing backflips or something like that. I imagine it happens. You know no, I mean? people wearing ankle weights for jumps and leaps and turns is a huge problem with hip issues. Like I've seen so many kids. I didn't even know. <laughs> that, that's, that's a big problem. That It's getting better now, but that still happens. And right, right, right. But it, it's stuff like that, you know, that like the extremes of, of – the joints can't handle it. Never mind putting extra weight on it, thinking, oh, if they can do it with five pound ink weight on it, they should be able to go faster without yeah. it. And it's just, it just doesn't work like that, you know? Especially in a 13 year old with a non closed growth plate. Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. I'm like, that's the stress. That growth plate is the weak point in the chain. That's why you don't see 12, 13 year old kids with, with elbow sprains or like ligament sprains. Mm. The weak point in the chain is the growth plate. And if the growth plate becomes affected, that's a huge issue. And there's different extremes to the growth plate being affected. You can have like a small separation or you can have a big separation where they actually have to put a pin in the joint to get the elbow, to, or for example, the elbow, to get that growth plate reapproximated back to the bone. If not, you're going to affect bone growth. Like what are we thinking right now? But that's, that's the weak point. You got to be careful with that. And again, there's the fine line, you know, but nobody wants, everybody's teetering. And that fine line is moving, 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 and nobody wants to really acknowledge that their fine line is, is the reason why these injuries are happening. But I think it's quite obvious, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, even breaking it down, like the real honest question, or the real honest conversation that's not happening is you have like the, the macro layer of injuries. You have the second layer, which is like, okay, well, why is little Johnny doing pitching lessons and this and that and training and playing showcases or gymnasts doing these year-round training, lots of meets, right? And you go even one layer deeper, and the real problem is that, unfortunately, there's a lot of kids who are parents or coaches who are living vicariously through their kids, I think. They're trying to show off the young, talented kid who can throw super hard, the gymnast who's super talented and can make national team at 11 or 12 or go level 10. And I think that that's the real problem here is I think that we, unfortunately, have too many people who are not thinking long-term and are, are like forcing people to peak super early because they think right. that, we have to go now. We have to get a scholarship now. We're getting recruited. We got to sign something right. at 13, 14. And like, right. that is crazy. That's what's driving this insanity is like, like the combination of coaches, parents, and let's be honest, medical providers sometimes living through the athlete and trying to, right. to be a part of their like, wow, look at how amazing you are. Right, or right, right. Like, right. People who, like the pressure from colleges combined with pressures of society and parents to like push super hard, like year round train, early specialized. Like that's why some, some of this stuff is happening. If you really want to dig down to it and fix it, figure out like, well, why are we pushing this kid so hard at 10 to 14? Like, are you trying to go to the Olympics or are you just trying to have right. fun? And like, right. well, that's just five years away. Like everybody just calm down, space yeah. some time, out, learn your skills foundationally, get strong, like learn how to take care of yourself, go through puberty. Like, and then at 14 on, you can push right. a little bit harder and more mature. Would you agree there? Yeah, definitely. We see that all the time. I, I can think of numerous kids, numerous, numerous, numerous kids that I've treated in my career, especially since being back in, in Boston when, after I left Birmingham, um, of kids that they, they're the biggest kids. They are the, the 10-year-old freak, the 12-year-old freak amongst the, his group of friends. And the coach, is, he's the best one, obviously. You know, I do baseball, so I'll say he, he's the best one out of the whole group, so he's going to pitch the most. He's going to play shortstop. He may even pitch and catch, although that rule has been implemented that you can't catch and pitch in the same game, but it still happens. Um, so they overuse him. They use him too much because he is the best. And so he eventually breaks down. I've seen it numerous times. I got a kid right now. He is by far the biggest kid in lacrosse. So to get away from baseball, he tore his ACL because he was the biggest kid and they just basically gang tackled him to try to get the ball out of his hoop. I don't know what a lacrosse stick. Um, and he, he got hurt. So, you know, you try to use your best kids, obviously, but to what extent, what, what's the injury risk? Because if he pitches multiple, multiple times, more than any other kid, because that coach wants to win all those games, because that 12-year-old tournament is going to be a huge win. You know what I mean? Like, it's a 12-year-old tournament. I know the kids want to win. You want to teach winning and all that. But 
my God, at the, at the expense of, of, of some 12 year old kid blowing out his elbow or you know, having to have surgery or something. I mean, we see it all the time and it's, it's, it's very frustrating. So I've educated parents. So my, my solution, not just giving you the problem, my solution is to have a serious conversation with the parents. And I've talked numerous parents into having their kids stop pitching. So I think we're seeing if kids, kids have so many bullets in their arsenal and somehow you guys can take this from baseball and somehow implement it into gymnastics, but you have so many bullets. And if you pitch too much as a 12, 13 year old, there's a good chance you're going to get hurt, which means your career is going to end early and you're not going to be able to get through high school ball, never mind college ball. Or if you get into college, you're probably going to get hurt eventually. There's a higher risk. If you have an elbow injury, if you have an elbow growth plate injury, you have a higher risk of Tommy John surgery, which is ligament replacement surgery in the elbow. So if we can avoid that early on, meaning decrease the volume of throws, meaning maybe they don't pitch as much or they don't pitch at all, which again, I've talked numerous parents into pulling their kids out of pitching, let them play shortstop, let them hit, and then pick pitching up later on. Um, if you're not going to control pitch counts and have them work out and maybe get them arm care and uh, you know, proper lessons, and there's so many different low hanging fruit, but the, I think if we can get kids to delay things a little, like you're saying in gymnastics, if we get them through puberty, it's a whole new world. Now you have, you have uh, growth hormones going through their body. They can get stronger. They, their bones are growing and they're starting to get skeletally mature. The stresses on the joints are completely different. We think when somebody's skeletally mature and has the muscle to withstand the forces, but like, you, like, we, like we've said numerous times, a 12, 13 year old just can't handle that, especially five, six hours a day, homeschool five, six hours a day. It's just, yeah. and not training and not getting uh, physical training and not getting resistive training, not getting stronger, you know, which they have very limited capability anyway, because of their lack of growth hormones. <laughs> it's yeah. just like yeah. this, this, this cycle that happens with these kids where they are training, but not getting stronger because they don't train or they just, they can't get too much stronger because they're too skeletally immature. So long winded yeah. answer, but you know, I think it's, um, it's a, it's tricky for us, but again, we're breaking down barriers. You're getting there somehow. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree. And this is definitely the translation that's happened. I mean, this is how I first got into learning about you and Mike in grad school as I was thinking about this stuff in baseball and translating it to, you know, Eric's stuff with strength conditioning stuff. But the translation in gymnastics is the same thing. You have a kid who's young and flexible, naturally powerful, just kind of cl- they get it. They get you know, they learn faster than other people. And so right. you have the molding of being amazing. And what happens is they learn these crazy hard skills at a young age, which are way higher force than most. They get rushed to a higher level and they start competing more and more often. And so solution wise for, for what we're talking about is definitely educating the parents on having a more, like taking care of their kids and standing up for their kids. But also it's not attacking the coaches and saying like, you guys are killing people. You need to stop. It's educating the coaches that like, Hey, if we could just work together and find a way to get the kid, you know, don't compete as much of these harder skills, like maybe pull back the number of meets you do per year. Like, why are we doing 10 meets per year, year round? Like it starts so early and so late and then they just take one week off and they train hard skills again. Like use the tools to advantage of softer surfaces and strength and conditioning and physical preparation. Like you can still train fun skills and get the kid prepared for high level, but just like maybe pull back that first gear a little bit. And so that when you do get stronger, you get a little older, they want, they still like gymnastics. They're not burnt out. Then they can jump into like high school age and start really progressing those skills up and still have plenty of time to get a scholarship. Thankfully now there's better earlier recruiting rules where you can't recruit till junior year. But before it was like, it was an open season on recruiting. So like people were signing these crazy letters of intent in like eighth grade. Right. And so that was a huge drop of why this is a problem you know, take more time to develop the athlete as a person and make them just capable of all these things. And then you right. can push on the skill profile later down the road. Well, that's what I'm always telling kids and parents is you're, you're having all these kids go to showcases and you're given the people that are at the showcases observing these kids, you're giving them 80% of what your kid has to offer because he's tired right now. Yeah. I don't know what, you know, you have some tests that you do on your kids and for a gymnast, we have certain tests that we do on baseball plays and we can see that they're fatigued and they'll be like, no, I'm fine. And then you start doing some strength tests on them and like, dude, you are, you're way down. You can go yeah. to the showcase, but do you want to show the people at the showcase like 80% of you, you know, do you want to show them that you're only throwing 80 miles per hour when you really throw 90 miles per hour? Like why, why would you want to do that just to go to a showcase? Cause your parents paid for it. You got to go to Disney world or, or wherever, South Carolina in the middle of yeah. August. You're like, what are you thinking right now? Or you got to go to a showcase in December. Like, can you imagine for us, a baseball kid who hasn't, he threw maybe a little in the fall, he takes October, November, and then he has to ramp back up in December for his showcase and then ramp back down because the high school season is not until April because we're in New England and it snows out till April now. Um, like, why would you go to a showcase in December when, you ha- when you're not even close to being your normal person? So, like, why do you want to show off 
how how good you you're not. You know what I mean? Like how do you when you know, show off like the 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 fraction of what you could have been when you could just skip that one and just you know, they'll find you. I, I tell this to kids all the time. You don't have to go to Division One schools to be found. It's different in gymnastics because not a lot of uh, you know D two or D three. I don't even think there are just you know yep. Springfield or whatever. Um, but they'll find you. We had numerous kids. We had a bunch, a couple of kids from Division Two baseball, Bentley uh, Bentley University down the street got drafted. So. Um, you know, it happens. They'll find you if you're good enough. Just put the work in and, and, and the, the word gets out. Where it's a small, especially gymnastics, I can't imagine where it gets yeah. out for scholarships and, and anything else. They'll, they'll find you. Same thing in baseball. There's a gazillion baseball players. I mean, my God, yeah, yeah. It's still, they still get found. So just do your work and, and talk to people and create relationships. Like, it's just pretty yeah, simple. well, the reality is that throwing 90 and doing a double layout when you're 14 looks sick on Instagram. That too. Right. No, I know. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, of course, social media has some influence in this of, of showing off what you can do and, and putting your word out there. But, you know, I guess they'll live and learn. Hopefully, if you screw up, your friends will, your friends will see that and then maybe they'll, they'll learn from you. I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Right. I think uh, it's getting better, but I agree from the college side. I mean, a lot of people are, are quick to point fingers at the coaches, quick to point fingers at the college, like recruiting system. But when I talk to, I mean, I'm lucky now that I work with a lot of high level NCAA coaches and medical staff. And like, they all say the same thing is that like, they want you healthy when you get there. Right. And if you look right. at again, shifting gears to like the NCAA data, there's been some crazy studies that have come out in the last year or last two years from the pilot data about like gymnasts have the highest rate of, uh, you know, injury, massive injuries coming into college, freshmen yeah. get the most hurt, they're the most yeah. burnt out, they quit. And like, they're right. the most highest use of opioids and after like injuries and stuff like that. Like that speaks to the problem yeah. is that the, the pursuit of trying to get a college scholarship is ruining your chances of actually competing in college. And you've seen in the clinic, right. I've had three or four NCAA gymnasts who like competed super hard for their whole life to get a college scholarship and they get to college and they broke freshman year, sophomore year, they were hurt, yeah. they couldn't compete. And they quit. That was it. They were yeah. done after getting there because they were broken. It's like, all right, you just wasted 15 years of your life trying not <laughs> wait. You spent 15 years of your life trying to get a college scholarship and you're so banged up when you got there that you had to medically retire. Yeah, no, I agree. There's definitely, I, I think I, I see this a lot in kids that are going from 12 to, 12 to 13 years old, meaning the field is a little league field to a bigger field. Then high school happens. And then going from high school volume of throwing to college because they just finished high school ball in say May and they only played 20 games, and they only probably pitched four or five of those games at the most. Um, and then they messed around in summer ball. If they did, if not, they're getting ready for college. And then they go to fall ball and baseball, and now they're throwing, 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 and they're a freshman. They're trying to impress the coaches and their teammates. And then next thing you know, you get a phone call in October, like, I don't know, my elbow's killing me. Can't get yeah. through it. I'm worried. What do I do? And they come and see you, and yeah, you get a Tommy John injury. You get some kind of shoulder injury. Mm. And now you, you just completely ruin your freshman year because you weren't prepared for those new stresses. It's all about the stress on the joints. If we could, if we somehow remember all that, these kids are not ready to go from high school to, to college a lot of times, whether it's gymnastics or baseball and those stresses, whether it's the stresses of, of throwing, it's the stresses of trying to study, it's the stresses of being on your own. It, it is so many different stresses that, that come onto the body. It's not just the physical stress. It's mm. all the other aspects of, of, of trying to be independent now and just whatever, however that affects the body, I think it plays into all that. And I think that's why that transition, especially high school to college, to me is, is critical. That those kids are prepared because they can break down pretty readily, pretty easily. And now we got, we got to, now they're bright shirting their freshman year and they're not part of the team and they're ostracized and they don't feel mm. like they're involved. And it's just, it's disastrous. So it's uh, it's even though those kids are ready to roll, it's not always, you know, it's not always obvious. So Yeah. And you brought up a really good point that I think is, is what we're kind of talking about in the issue of not only the younger kids who are like early talented, but also those transitional years of college and whatever it is, is that, yeah. you know, the, the optimal dosage of stress, stress plus the optimal recovery does create adaptation. That's like the basic equation of how we're designed, whether we're doing that with PT or strength and conditioning or in the technical side of throwing or doing gymnastics. The problem is that when you have all these competitive stressors of school and another sport and camps and clinics and showcases, like there's never time to get recovery so your body can adapt. And that's why periodization is so important. But like that's what I see as the biggest issue is no, typically no one's ever afraid to, if they really care about the sport, they're not afraid to work hard, right? And the coaches want to push them. But the problem is that with either a really, if you're doing two a days and you don't recover at night and you wake up the next morning for practice, you're still, you're like 50% in the tank, like you're completely right. gassed out. Yeah. So the reason we're being so, I guess, like sticky about like trying to make sure you understand the optimal dose of stress is because you don't get stronger when you're throwing or when you're doing pull-ups. You get it when you do that, eat well, sleep enough, drink water, 
take care of yourself right. and go to bed and you wake up and you're, you're stronger, you're better over the course of a week. So like, that's the equation you have to play with is like stress over a week, stress over a season and then stress over a career of 10 years from right. 12, from whatever, eight to 18 that you got to manage somebody if they want to get to college. Right. And I think that's what Tim Gabb is trying to do. Um, you know, I'm very curious to hear what he has to say and how we can potentially apply it to baseball. It's, it's a struggle for us right now to be able to apply those concepts to baseball. Maybe he can drop some knowledge on us when I talk to him uh, soon. Um, but I know you've done, how are you doing with that? How's that gymnastics acute chronic? Is that, is that working? Are you seeing good progress? I know it's still early. Are you seeing yeah. good things with that? Not to turn the podcast into me no. asking you questions, but I'm just curious. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the real issue, right? Going back to the, the how much is too much. The real issue is culture change and dealing with people's egos and, right. and money and power and status seeking. The other half is finding a better workload equation. And so, yeah, I think that, so definitely there's, um, Tim's done so much good work in other sports. And I think that it's been really helpful to, to build a system that starts in gymnastics. There's definitely some pushback I'm seeing in the research about how maybe it's not valid and like, it's not right. as good as it means. And like, obviously right. the pen is yeah. super hard. So anybody yeah. who's like, Tim, Tim, out of all people I've worked with, I thought he was going to be only a numbers guy, but he does care about the athlete and the person right. and just talk about the issue. And so that being said, yeah, we're developing, um, we're in the final stages of, of we pilot data that 10 weeks and it was, it was interesting to see. Um, I don't think it was, it was way too biased. I was doing it. It was like complete garbage methods of stat, of like stat taking and stuff. But the interesting thing for me was to see, I prescribed the same training load for 10 weeks to all the athletes, but the graphs of different responses based on school, stress, sleep, right. different stuff was like all over the map. So that was the biggest thing that I took away of the pilot data so far was that like the yeah. individual response of training is massively different for all the kids. Right. And, and I'm sure in baseball, you'd see the same thing that if you got like a whole bunch of kids and you had something that was valid and you put it into practice, you'd be like, holy hell, like we threw, we all threw the same amount of pitches. We kind of did the same workouts. Right. Like, Why is Johnny like, happy as a clam and like little Phil over here is miserable. And like, you yeah. see that cause the emotional, that's how our stress yeah, response absolutely. works. But yeah. We're in the second stage now. So I paid, um, I'm working with one of Tim's people. I paid him to create gymnastics specific data worksheets that we're going to put in next, but the goal is to get multi-center non-biased data. And I think that we're really onto something. If nothing else, we're at least looking at, um, how the body of a gymnast responds to a training load. And that alone is pretty important in a valid way. So for people that are not familiar, you take, we're taking the, the time on an event, we're multiplying that by a weighting factor, which is like one is just a warm up four is like the hardest thing you've ever done in your life of a routine. We're multiplying that by a, an event rate of perceived exertion. So we'll get three numbers multiplied, gives you a training unit for that event, and you add that up for the day. You get an arbitrary gymnastics unit, which then you get to the week, and you can look at the comparison of week to week training loads. But I like it because coaches can plan. Uh, what they think they want the training load to be working up to a competition. And then their gymnasts can report in the graphs that we have now are going to show the differences between those two of actual versus perceived training loads. So it's coming along, but now it's got to be, we got to get a lot of money to pay for it in other centers that are not mine. Right. Yeah. Neat. That sounds, sounds great. I don't know how we would ever do that with baseball. I feel like we could, it's just, I don't know. I don't know. It's just all these kids, you have bigger teams and you have different positions and, you know, first baseman versus pitcher versus catcher. And it, it's just, I don't know, I guess, I guess you just focus on pitchers and just see what they do. And then you have relief pitches and you have, you just have all these, you have guys all over the place. So I don't know. It's curious, but I'm definitely going to pick Tim's brain. I know Mike will too, when he comes to our facility sometime in 2019. Yeah. Yeah, I think the uh, the I think it can be done in baseball too because you guys have the luxury of better technology, which is what I struggle with. Because you know right. the, the good thing about Tim's work in rugby and soccer is you just slap a GPS on someone, you strap a heart rate monitor, and you can look at like accelerometer data of high seed sprinting versus you know heart rate versus that. And you guys could probably use the Moda sleeve and some other stuff like that with data compared to heart rate with compared to perceived exertion and get some sort of thing. The challenge is that there's there's two ends of, of workload systems that if people aren't familiar, there's an, there's an external workload, which is like the number of throws, the number of times you impact the floor in gymnastics, the, you know, the actual work done, like the, the number yeah. of pounds you lift in the weight room. And then in between you have on the other side is an, is an internal workload, which is the perceived exertion, right? And because the body's perception of stress recruits a bigger stress response. So if like you're super sleepy and you didn't really eat enough and you feel like crap, the workouts yeah. perceived way harder. So you recruit a bigger what's called an allostatic load. So you have more, like you pour more resources into doing it. It takes longer to recover. So you have well being on one side, you have external workloads on the in outside and you want to get markers of both of those, which is GPS data. And then, you know, wellness surveys, the thing in the middle with the thing we're doing in this gymnastics version is trying to get a mixed modality of both. So it's like 
rate of perceived exertion, but it also has a prescription of workload and it also has a time duration. So if we're going to try to put a heart rate monitor on somebody, do it with the system that I'm building and then also correlate that to maybe performances of scores it meets and things like that, which is why I'm paying someone to build this data worksheet because it's crazy complex. But the thought is that if we use that with injury data, we could maybe gather a year's worth of data and see the workloads and then reverse correlate the risk to heart rate data or impacts or scores, things like that and see what happened. But yeah. I think that could happen in baseball. I really do. You just got to, yeah. it's someone who knows the sport to speak the language and be able to understand how to create a system. But then it also takes someone who knows the sport to build trust with the athletes to be compliant and tracking the data. That's the hardest right. part. Yeah. Yeah. I worry about rate of perceived exertion that kids aren't going to really tell the truth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they're just like, no, nah, I feel like I'm fine. I'm, I'm like a seven. I feel good when they're like, you know, you know, you're not. You know what I mean? Yeah. But kids don't always want to reveal their weaknesses. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the range of kids, right? Like, some kids going to be like, nah, it's a zero. And you know, they're like about to black out. And then some kids like sweat right. one drop, like 10 out of 10. This is awful. Yeah. Right, exactly. No, I know. So, yeah, who knows? <laughs> yeah. So, let's shift gears a little bit more on the solution side. I think we've done a very good job of saying we have a problem. Um, but let's spend the last 15 minutes on. Like, let's go practical solutions to what we yeah. have found helpful making a dent in, you know, some of the knee injury risk or also like on the medical side, let's maybe talk about like what needs to happen to make sure people are ready with not just like ACL meniscus, you know, right. knee pain, or yeah, PSG, yeah. Uh, term. just in, in general, I think, I just think kids need to, they need to find a medical practitioner, a PT or a strength coach that they trust because I think it's somebody who's engaged in the field. They know the sport. Like we know baseball, you know, gymnastics, you know how to speak the language and talk the talk. Um, and then it's implementing a program that's best for them. Understanding that they want to do this training, gymnastics specific training, but they have to do strength training. They need to learn how to jump and land correctly. Um, you know, I don't know what the, the ACL risk is or the knee risk uh, injury rate for uh, gymnastics. It's not that high. high. It, high, right, exactly. It's not that high in baseball, but we know that we can control the forces on the shoulder and elbow by implementing certain certain uh, programs into a kid's uh, life that will affect uh, how how much layback he has, so how far back he can throw the ball, how much how far back he can get his uh, his elbow, his shoulder. Um, and if we can keep flexibility, if we can keep range of motion, if we can keep strength and have a baseline, and you're taking baseline measurements on the kids specific to their sport, whatever that is in gymnastics, I'll leave that up to you guys. If you can keep those, those baseline numbers in a certain range, I think you have, you're going to lower your risk for injury, Never mind, you know, reducing uh, the volume of throws and all, all the other stuff that happens or, or jumps and landings or, you know, uh, tumble tracking. Um, I know I'm kidding. I don't know gymnastics um, that well. I know gymnastics a little, I know it a lot better now than I did three, four years ago. It was um, painful when we first started. Yeah, it's still painful, but um, I, I think we have to implement certain programs like strength training, like we do arm care, whether you do back care or, you know, whatever that is giving the kids a feeling that they're, they're feeling better, they're making gains, they're recovering faster, they're implementing a better diet and sleep education. And when you get kids staying up till two, three in the morning playing Fortnite. I mean, and then going to school the next day, it's absolutely out of control. It's Fortnite still a thing. I know kids are still playing Fortnite. Um, but uh, we talked about the sleep. So educating, there's a ton of education, but people don't want to hear it. So it's, it's actually doing stuff. So they see the gains that they see the, the, the rewards of, of their work. And um, for us, like I said, we're doing soft tissue work on shoulder. I, I know that applies to gymnastics. We're trying to keep, you know, flexibility for a baseball player. It's getting in the overhead position for gymnastics. Same thing. It's just they're tumbling on their hands. Um, is keeping hips and quads strong in the baseball throwing motion. If you don't have strong hips and, 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 and glutes and quads, you're in trouble. Same thing. Yeah. Obviously, same thing. Look at gymnasts. They're huge in that area. Um, and you say, all right, well, they're so big in that area. Why do they still get hurt? It's a volume issue. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a fatigue issue. So it still comes down to maintaining the strength that they had at baseline. So for us, we're implementing these programs, and uh, we think we're helping. We are helping. It seems like it. We have kids that come back to us and say, I had the best year I've ever had. Thanks for helping me out. I've never done this stuff before. We hear it all the time. So I think there is a – we think there's a solution, somewhat of a solution. It's just it has to be implemented and accepted by coaches and parents, you know? Yeah, I agree too. I think that the the practical solutions to these things, number one, like we said, is education is like not pointing fingers at anybody, but taking accountability for your role and maybe needing to learn more and, and get new concepts, but working together to educate the athletes, the parents, the coaches, the medical providers, everybody to be on the same page is really important. But then 
Two is definitely changing the way we approach flexibility and making sure that the joints are not already getting stressed with like crazy in range stretching or stuff like that, which is what you guys have done a lot of work in baseball to help, you know, pitchers learn about. And then right. three, yeah. That is, a, is a better hybrid model of strength and conditioning that's scientifically based and has, you know, good research to support why you're doing certain exercises. Like the, if you look at champion, like probably 70% of the programs between baseball and gymnasts that come and work out with us in the, in the summer and stuff are pretty similar, but there's a lot of variability too for the different demands of a gymnast. So it's doing proactive right. soft care, it's strength and conditioning. It's, it's, it's the delayed gratification of a longer, you know, competitive right. career, not peaking so early. Like all these things are conversations we need to have that are, that are not happening because of, I don't know, whatever it is, you know, attention and status and trying to get money and, and, you know, young kids to get pushed hard. But those are the real conversations that if you, if you want to make a, a dent in the knee injury risk, the elbow injury risk, the shoulder injury risk or back or whatever, like you have to have these hard conversations with the athletes and with the parents and be like, listen, I know you want to push real hard now, but like you're at a super high risk of open growth plates. You're growing fast. Like you're going to get stiff because when you grow, your muscles get a little stiffer and you got to catch up. Like you have a huge risk of injury right now. And like, maybe we need to pull back on competitions. Maybe we need to take like a, a gap year, so to speak, where we do very minimal competitions and we just work on getting you strong, getting you through puberty, like building a foundation, like learning how to take care of yourself, learning how to go to sleep and recover and stuff like right. that. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, 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 there's a lot. There's so many different avenues you can go down as long as people are willing to listen. Some are, and some are going to walk out of that meeting and say, like, this guy does not know what he's talking about. He's, he's not what we want to hear. And they'll move on to find somebody else. There's always going to be somebody else out there who's going to say what you want to hear and implement the programs that you want because there's money involved. So you hope that you're putting a good message out and people trust you and word gets out to their friends. And it's happening yeah. with you. It's happened with you. you got a ton of kids that now come down from all over the U.S., you know, yeah. if not all over the world that are coming to see you. So word is getting out. Um, and I think all that eventually shows it eventually, you know, you can do everything you can, all the other programs that are out there. I think eventually the, the honest and true and respectable program that is, is not going to break the bank and it's not, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's helpful and kids are talking about it. I think, and you, you respect the kids and you talk their language. I, I think that it eventually it comes out and then people will eventually buy in. It's just, you got a, you got a long road ahead with, with the gymnastics world. And we still do a baseball just because it, it is what it is. A lot of old school thinking still going on. Yeah. So I can't imagine gymnastics is still, like I said, tip the iceberg with gymnastics, but the, yeah, it's, it's out there. It can happen. It, it will happen. It has to happen. You know? Yeah. It's a little stubborn, but thankfully we see, you know, I agree. I think so we've had the program going for four years in the summer now. And a lot of kids definitely extenuate that and do proactive care. Like I'd say 30% of the people I see are just more soft tissue maintenance sports performance, which is awesome because we have a good model that allows that. But I think we're seeing now like, some of the top NCAA programs who I've been fortunate to work with are saying like, man, this is, I think we're seeing a difference now that we've done this for two years. And like a lot of young kids, like some of the girls that I've been working with for five years on the medical side, like they've started jumping into the summer program. And like, like a couple have come back this year and the last year is like, man, I've never had a better college competitive season. Like I felt pretty good. Like I got a little banged up, but like, I wasn't, I wasn't like super sore or painful like it was before. And right. so I think, you know, we're seeing the manifestation of it now kind of emerge a little bit. And, um, you know, like I said, it takes, it takes someone who, you know, is open to learning new things. And like, I've learned so much from you and Mike and Kiefer and all these other people that I would never have exposure to if I just sat in my four walls in the gym and said like, nope, you guys don't know what you're talking about. Like gymnastics is different, right? Gymnastics is unique, but it's no different than any other sport in terms of the, the principles that you need to be successful. Right. I, I think the one thing gymnastics is different and for some is the jumping and landing. We didn't hit upon that. And I want to talk about that because I jumping and landing is, is critical because we see if you jump and land, if you land, sometimes jumping, but if you land a certain way, you have a higher risk of tearing your ACL, like higher risk of hurting your knee. And I feel like the gymnastics change the rules where you don't have to land so so upright, so extended in the knee, we can land with a little bit more flexion because we know if you land in a little bit more flexion, so the knee is a little bit more bent when you land, you're recruiting more of the muscles to get more co-contraction of the quads in the front and the hamstrings in the back to kind of stabilize the knee. I think teaching jumping and landing techniques has been shown to reduce injuries in up to about 67%. There was a meta-analysis that just came out, I think it was last year, by Tim Hewitt and Kate Webster, kind of big wigs of the ACL research world. And they showed a 67% reduction in ACL injuries if you teach how to jump and land, if you teach neuromuscular control drills that are helping the kids get stronger and land a certain way and land quieter and you know softer. So I think like we have to implement the right programs to our kids. And hopefully the gymnastics world will allow the kids to jump and land 
correctly, so to speak, and not so yeah. vulnerable, where yeah. you, you're basically a, a, a jumping and landing that is accepted in gymnastics is putting that kid at a really high risk of hurting yeah. the knee, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you read my mind because this is what I wanted to end on before we split. And so the reason this is, still exists, I don't know where this came from, if I'm being completely honest. Like I, I got taught to land like that just because it, like, I think it honestly, the only thing I think of is it's aesthetics. People think it right. looks clear and like a right. ballet or land like that but like ballet dancers don't do triple backs off high bar and land <laughs> with forces right. 15 times their body weight and so right. yeah i think that that's been the biggest struggle and it speaks to it's a perfect point to end on because it speaks to everything we've talked about is like the research is clear that this is something that can massively reduce the injury risk of everything not even acl tears but the the, the stresses through the achilles the stresses through the knee, yeah. That yeah. Stuff, yeah. so if we know that like so for people that are not familiar so the gymnastics way, obviously, as you would know, is more of like a feet together, upright torso, hips are kind of tucked under knee dominant strategy versus what the research says is feet hip width apart in line with the hips, more of a posterior weight shift contraction down to I think 30 degrees glute angle or hip angle and knee angle to, to use eccentric overload and like a more of a, a quad hip dominant strategy with more of a pitch of a, a parallel tibial and trunk angle. Like that's what the research says is supportive. And before we talk about like, maybe the implications of not doing that. Like why once and for all, I want to tell the read, like the listeners, why is it so important that someone does land in that hip dominant strategy? What are the, like the implications for like risk of knee when you don't land like that? Right. If you don't, if you don't land in a 30 degree, what we say around 30 degrees, we are co-contracting the quadriceps in the front and the hamstrings in the back. You are putting a ton of shearing force. When you're jumping and landing, you have a risk of hyperextending the knee. You know what I mean? Or if you're too, you're too upright, you get that quick jolt and now you're risking the meniscus. You know what I mean? Where you're not getting a nice, easy co-contraction of the muscles. The muscles aren't taking the force. The forces are going to go somewhere. So they do this. And if they're doing this, you're risking bone bruises. We talked about bone bruises earlier, the implications long-term for arthritis in the knee. You're also risking the cartilage in the knee joint. So the meniscus and the cartilage that's on the end of the, of each bone, you're risking doing damage to those surfaces. Never mind the ankle where we see, you know, tailor dome fractures and, and, and uh, stress fractures in the, in the talus. That's why it's happening. We're not using the muscles to their fullest ability to absorb the shock and the forces are going to go somewhere. Right. And they're going to probably go through the soft tissue, the bones. And, and now that's when you start dealing with other issues. And if they're too upright, maybe you start landing in an extended position. Now you, you maybe low back is implicated as well. So you get low back, hip, knee, ankles, um, it's, it's, it's so many different joints that are affected by just not landing correctly. Never mind, we already know a 67% reduction in ACL injuries if they're taught to jump and land correctly and get stronger in that position. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it's an easy 67%. Like, why not do it? But I know the sport of gymnastics is traditionally not landed like that. I guess you would yeah. get penalized, right? If you don't land. Exactly. You get like you that, get exactly right? in score if you land you know, the, the code is aesthetic based and it's not based on right. science. Um, but yeah, it goes to, it goes to like those, those factors are super modifiable. We can work on those. Right. And it goes to, you know, everything we talked about having good ankle flexibility, knowing how to squat properly, knowing the difference between gymnastics specific, like bounding technique, like versus landing properly. There's two different things that an athlete has to learn and knowing how to switch between strategies is that's neuromuscular teaching and control. So once you have the ability and you know how to squat, that's why strength and conditioning is so important because if you can land in that way and then teach your body to absorb the forces with more muscular strength and co-contraction and eccentric control, you're going to put the force spread wide throughout the entire lower body and the core versus when you land the other way, like we said, like the, a lot of the same injuries and impact related stuff, ankle to uh, ankle, you know, to OCD issues or talar dome fractures, Achilles stress and, and Severs disease and stuff, Osgood of the knee, you know, issues in the hip, issues in the extension of low back. It's all from the same 15 times body weight forces going through you and you're not absorbing it well, it's going somewhere, like depending on who you are and how you land, it might go to your back, it might go to your knee, it might be right. a, an overuse stress fracture or it might blow your ACL out or over time, but like it's, right. it's all the same equation of like stress over the ability to take it, which just goes back to the global thing we talked about of stress. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it comes down to education. It always does. It always comes down to education and communication about that. And until people are willing to listen, we're going to still be fighting this. And hopefully, you know, just getting people respectable out there that 
um, you know, willing to talk about it and not afraid to talk about it and, and can get the platform to talk about it. I think it's critical. So I, I again, I applaud you and, uh, you know, hopefully what we've done a little in baseball, still a long ways to go can still be, you know, it can be, you know, implemented in the gymnastics world and changes can be made because there's a lot of changes, you know, it's just not, it's not as popular a sport. It's not like baseball. It's not on, you know, it's not the game of the week on ESPN. It's just, you know what I mean? It's just, it's this little niche of a sport and, it's to, it's not, I don't know, it's, it needs to be talked about more. Unfortunately, gymnastics has had a bad rap recently with other stuff. Yeah. So word is out there on gymnastics. But, you know, I think, I, again, I applaud you for, uh, for trying to make change because it's not easy. If you're trying to, you know, turn the Titanic and it's, it's just not an easy thing to do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite an analogy, actually, if you think about it. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, the iceberg's coming. <laughs> yeah. How are we going to both get on the door though? Like Jack and uh, how we both fit on the door to make sure nobody goes down in the water. Exactly. Right, exactly. On the door. <laughs> Playing poker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that goes, that's a good way to end it from the starting with game of Thrones to ending with Titanic. That'll be, with Titanic. Yeah, exactly. that'll be my lesson now. That'll be the clip that we use. We'll cut from game of Thrones to Titanic with ACLs in right. between. <laughs> All right. Well, Lenny, um, I thank you for your time. You have so much that uh, you've taught me and I'm lucky to have you and Mike and everybody else at champion to help me with this uphill journey. But, um, where can people find more about, you know, if they want to learn about some of that ACL stuff or they want to know about you and, you know, stuff that yeah. you're working. Yeah, you can find me. I'm all over social media. I'm at Len Mac PT, L E N M A C P T. I'm on Twitter, Instagram. I have a Facebook page. I also have my own web page, Lenny com, where I'm constantly putting stuff out there, uh, blog posts, and just trying to get the word out there on what I think is the best way to rehab people and what I've done, my experience. I have a YouTube channel as well. So, you know, get out there and, 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 and subscribe to my, to my blog and uh, hopefully we can uh, interact and, and, and continue to just spread the, the good word. You can also just roll up on him at the golf course and maybe just see if he's doing. Yeah, exactly. Well, if you want to, we'll golf together and we can talk uh, injuries. I'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds good, Len. Uh, I will see you in an hour when I get to the clinic. Absolutely. Thanks, Dave. See you later.